Hey, what's good? Hey, Thomas, what is good is today in general. How about you? Yep. Fucking A, man. Couldn't agree more. Woke <laughs> up healthy, happy. Uh, love doing interviews. Love talking about this stuff. So it's already a good day. Hello, everyone. This is James Jesso, and you are listening or watching Adventures Through the Mine. This episode is releasing on December 21st of 2018, the winter solstice, and, uh, you know, remarkably close to a variety of winter holidays and festivals, the one that I grew up celebrating being Christmas. In the modern world, of course, uh, or at least the modern Western world, the the most immediate cultural association to Christmas, besides Christianity, is Santa Claus. Um, and these two immediate associations, Christianity and Santa Claus, are going to be the topic of today's show with Tom Hatzis. But before we get into that, I would like to take this opportunity to just make a couple announcements. So as you may or may not know, this podcast is still pretty small and it's growing and I'm very happy about that. And uh, now I'm looking for different ways to, you know, really continue what I see as the point and purpose of this podcast, which is getting good content into psychedelic culture and, you know, culture at large uh, in the modern world and having good discourse, discourse, discourse and discussion around it. Um, so a couple of the things that I have recently done to try to better encourage that is uh, I have started a subreddit and I have also started a new Instagram page. The subreddit comes um, from a desire to create a place for people to discuss the ideas around, uh, you know, discuss the topics of each podcast or the videos I release or other, you know, content that is relevant and to be able to engage with each other and, and get to know each other and really have these good conversations. And I chose Reddit instead of Facebook Facebook because Reddit archives things so that they can be searchable later. And I mean, as much as I've already had issues with Facebook for a while, um, privacy wise, and their sort of company intentions, I'm getting, you know, it's increasingly more concerning as time goes on. So I chose Reddit because Reddit seems to have a higher integrity. Um, and because the discussions aren't just going to get lost in the abyss of the feed because there's some great discussions that have gone on on Facebook and now they're just gone forever. So discussions that other people can learn from. So I started the subreddit. The new Instagram feed I started because as much as I just, you know, I just made my case against Facebook, uh, Instagram is a pretty hot tool right now for reaching a lot of people. And so my personal page has been fun and it has a you know great amount of subscribers and Although the style of the page does not really meet well with the, you know, the mass, the possibility of, you know, mass contact with people. And so I've started a new one that's just podcast specific and it has, you know, images, well, obviously as images, Instagram, um, but it has memes and other, you know, podcast related stuff and everything that I post, I put in a little something, something about why I feel it's relevant and hopefully it's going to reach a wider audience. So I would ask you, um, you know, having now listened to this for the last, you know, three or so minutes uh, to please head over and check out the new Instagram page, please follow it and go participate in the discussion on the new subreddit, which is our at mine podcast. Links to that are going to be in the description to this episode. Thank you very much for doing so. The final uh, announcement before we get into that, get into this episode, and I'll make it quick, is that the new t-shirts are up on Adventures Through the Mind gift shop, uh, as well as a uh, some limited edition artwork. The blotter art is still available, um, and my new lecture about um, uh, sort of a an ex. Uh, 
exist what's what did i call it? A, a psychedelic solution to existentialism <laughs> or <coughs> or some or something wow this, that, this is the lamest i'm not going to cut this out and do it again even though it's kind of lame um it's just one of those days i guess uh so please head over there and check it out um i would really appreciate it if you bought some stuff it supports the podcast and it's also uh, a time of year where a little bit of extra funds in my world is, is is you know appreciated because well like i said my i grew up on christmas and since my family are both Christians and capitalists for good or for ill, uh, you know, there's some spending involved. So I would really appreciate you picking up a shirt for yourself or a loved one and uh, or just picking up a lecture. Either way, that's it. Links to that are contained in the description as well. Let's move on to the episode. All right, so this episode features Thomas Hatsis, who writes and speaks on psychedelic history. He is the author of The Witch's Ointment, The Secret History of Psychedelic Magic, Psychedelic Mystery Traditions, and Microdosing Magic, a Psychedelic Spellbook. He also appears on the Gaiam TV shows Psychedelia and Open Minds with Regina Meredith, and has several articles published in Psychedelic Press UK. Hatzis believes that in the psychedelic renaissance, we must separate the modern lore from authentic history, a task he takes up by dismantling the tired and inept holy mushroom hypotheses in articles, videos, and books. And he is the guest for this show, specifically taking down some holy mushroom conspiracies. You have probably noticed, if you are a psychedelically inclined person, that especially last year, um, and probably already right now, the swell of Santa was a mushroom shaman articles are probably coming out the wazoo in every direction. And as fun as it, and exciting as it is to participate in such wild conjecture, according to today's guest, there is no solid evidence to even support it as a hypothesis, um, that it is just lazy thinking. And he's going to go into to why. And not only is he going to go into why and how the mushroom shaman Santa Claus is not the case, but we go deeper and deeper into Christianity, the origins of Christmas, and the drugs people were taking in early Christianity. And like I said, as someone raised in a Christian family with Christmas, uh, Christ's mass, you know, um, being participated in every year of my life since I was born, it's so interesting for me to go deep into this topic. And I hope Hope that you find it interesting as well. I'm going to quickly give a shout out to the patrons whose names are listed on the screen here uh, on YouTube or in the description to this episode on whatever podcatcher you are listening to it. Those patrons contribute significantly. So thank you very much, as well as a thanks to all you patrons who are supporting. If you would like to become a patron and support the show, you can do so by heading to jameswgesso.com forward slash support to get info on becoming a patron. Other ways you could support include a Bitcoin slash crypto donation i know that's sort of like a weird thing right now you know but i'm I, i'm still into it like i'm still hard on crypto let's let's go there um or you could do paypal donation that said i'd like to thank julie andrew and lobardo for your significant paypal donations over the last month or so again anything to support the podcast is listed in the at jameswjesso.com forward slash support or in the description to this episode that's enough for me thank you for listening to the announcements at the beginning of this episode here is my interview with thomas hatsis on adventures through the mind enjoy Whew. all right how do you say your last name thomas hatsis yeah like a hat on your head you call your sister sis got it well thomas hatsis welcome to adventures through the mind thank you for having me it's good to uh, be here yeah, I just finished reading your book this morning, in fact. Uh, it was yep. going to be yesterday, but I was in a bit of a funk, and I was like, I can't read, uh, you know, ADHD, whatever. I, yeah, I have those days. You're yeah. just on YouTube for, like, hours watching drunk people fall over. Right, right. Or watching people who may or may not be drunk um, talk their way out of traffic stops. <laughs> oh, yeah, oh. those are great, too. And, uh, oh. Ancient Aliens is a good one, too, when you just kind of want to shut your brain. Like, when you just want dumb entertainment sometimes, <laughs> Ancient Aliens is the way to go. Oh, that's fun. I I usually reach towards cartoons if I want uh, dumb entertainment in some way or another, but, like Duckman from the 90s, maybe. <laughs> that's smart entertainment, dude. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. All right. So speaking of smart entertainment, you know, I was quite entertained. Well, this is sort of a weird segue. I just want to get back on the topic. Your book was really cool. Um, and, uh, it is, I, I, you know, I was given the heads up on the book 
when I, I'm going to be honest with you, when I first saw the title of it, I was like, ah, this is probably not going to interest me. You know, um, uh, you know, whatevs. And then when I saw you speak, I was like, I, at the Spirit Plant Medicine Conference, I was like, I had this guy totally all wrong. I judged a book by its cover. How dare I? So when yeah. I actually got into reading your book, I was, I wasn't at that point pleasantly surprised because I'd already knew that I was going to appreciate what you had to say. But I definitely found myself uh, very... Uh, very taken by like how many interesting things that I learned, especially about the um, the early years of Christianity and the use of, of what you say in the book, the pharmacon or some type of psychedelically inclined herbs and, and plants in, in early Christianity. And it's a real wealth of, of knowledge and a very, I'm, I'm sort of just like promoing your book right now, in a very, you know, for the most part, really easy to read narrative style that's quite pretty as well. So I just wanted to thank you for the for the cool read that I just got to experience over the last couple of weeks. Well, I appreciate that. And I, I will never come down on anybody for over-promoting my book, so no worries. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, no, I appreciate that. I really do. It was, um, it was a long, uh, I, I, you're an author, you know what it's mm-hmm. like. It's a long, arduous process and you're, you're, it kind of drives you a little nuts yeah. a little bit. Yeah, it's like while. building a house. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. So let's. This is a holiday themed episode um, because it's coming out around the solstice, you know, twenty first, twenty second ish, close to Christmassy. You got uh, you got some Amanita muscaria in the background uh, of of uh, okay. of this video. If anyone's watching on YouTube, and so I want to just cut straight to the chase here on, on one of the questions I think is is gonna is most appropriate for this year and this moment uh, for this podcast, which is, okay, there's a story coming up over the last few years, but I saw it reach a real height last year around around Christmas time, around the holiday season, which is the the story that Santa Claus, the legend of Santa Claus, has its roots in Siberian shamanism and the fly agaric or Amanita muscaria mushroom that the you know, famous red and white caps is, is, you know, connected to his red and white outfit. Why don't you just maybe start by presenting to us what that theory is and why you believe it is patently false? Sure. Um, first, I would just say it's not a theory. It's a hypothesis because it's it doesn't even register as, as a theory. <laughs> um, I, I mean, it barely registers as a hypothesis. So the idea is... Um, Ever since John Marco Allegro's Sacred Mushroom and the Cross came out, people have been trying to throw Amanita Muscaria traditions onto all things Christian. So Jesus was really a mushroom. John the Baptist was really a mushroom. The whole Christian drama is really just about mushrooms. And when that didn't play out so well, at least among academic uh, um, circles, because there's no evidence for it at all, um, people moved the target away to something easy like Santa Claus. And I mean, it's unfortunately, I I hate to use this term, but it's a product of just lazy thinking. Mm -hmm. They see the red and white of Santa's outfit and the red and white of an Amanita Muscaria and oh, that must be it. And the what they don't know. And it's interesting because all people who believe the let's call it holy mushroom conspiracy. One thing they all have in common is they all aren't even aware of how little they know about this topic that they prize so much. Hmm. What many don't realize is that as far as the whole Amanita Santa Claus thing is, they're really talking about four different lines of evidence and four different historical lines, excuse me, I should say, um, one of which doesn't even exist. They had to make it up. Hmm. So the one that they had to make up was the idea of um, shaman reindeer herders, as I'm sure you've heard of this. Okay, there is no such thing as a reindeer herding shaman in all of Siberia. That is a made-up character in American society. Not even American society, just these conspiracy theorists who believe this kind of... Am I allowed to curse? You can say anything you want. That believe this kind of horseshit. So you have the made-up idea of Siberian reindeer shaman her or uh, excuse me reindeer herding shamans so that we can x out right away because that isn't even that's a made up that's they might as well talk about the the you know the historical line of the smurfs if you're going to talk about siberian reindeer shaman herders that are you know that's not a real thing so, so there's there's there's, like, there's there's no there's no actual anthropological evidence that suggests that in siberia there's shamanic traditions that connect with 
reindeer herding and well, with the reindeer eating the amanita and drinking the urine, like the shamans drinking the urine. Sure, but those the... are different. We'll get into all that ah, because okay, okay. what you're talking about is that 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 um is correlation equaling causation. Mm. And so there are some. I'm not saying that people weren't eating amanita muscaria in you know certain Siberian shamans. That's not what I'm saying at all. I'm saying the idea that Santa Claus is derived from that is total nonsense. Okay. So you have the made up character of the siberian shaman reindeer herder as one line of ev as of history which doesn't even exist <laughs> then you have the line of saint nicholas then you have the line of santa claus or sinterklaus and then you have the line of winter festivals and all four of those things never actually overlapped in history until the modern day so people today look at all of this and it's just kind of easy. It's very, it's just easy to just throw it all together into something. But when you go back and actually look at the evidence, there's, there's nothing there. Like mm -hmm. there, there are no Siberian reindeer herding shamans. That's not a real thing. Not mm -hmm. to belabor the point, but I just think it's interesting that in order for these conspiracy theorists to have their fantasy, they literally have to make up a character in history to get there. Right. And so that's not good history. No, I, I, I agree. I mean, one of the big things for me when I first heard about it, I was like, well, that's cute. Um, but I mean, the just the even the idea that, oh, the red and white of Santa Claus's outfit connects to the red and white of the mushroom seems ridiculous because it's like, well, Santa Claus wasn't red and white until Coca-Cola. I knew this until Coca-Cola made him red and white uh, so that they could basically create the allure of the Santa Claus we know now as a marketing gimmick to their brand, which was already red and white. Absolutely. Uh, the only thing I would disagree with is that there wasn't an image of Santa in red and white before Coca-Cola. So the red and white, and I go over this in, in the book, the red and white from Santa's outfit originally comes from the red, white, and blue of the American flag. Hmm as illustrated by Thomas Nast on the cover of Harper's Weekly in, I think, 1862 or 3. I forget the year, but it's one of those two. And what he shows is um, not even Santa Claus. It's still St. Nicholas um, dressed in, you know, uh, uh, his coat and, his, uh, and um, uh, knickerbockers. And the coat has uh, stars on it and the knickers have stripes on it. And above Santa in this piece, you have the American flag waving as... Uh, or excuse me, not Santa, St. Nicholas, as he's giving uh, um, provisions to Union soldiers. See, I, I, let me just point out that even I fall for this sometimes. Our idea of a historical Santa Claus and a historical St. Nick being one and the same is so ingrained in our culture that I'm messing it up right now, even as I'm talking against it. Mm -hmm. That's how ingrained this, this error is. Um, so... I'm sorry. Uh, where were we going with You were that? talking uh, about I'm, the red, sorry. white, and blue of the outfit yes, yes, that was yes. represented on the cover. Of yes. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. I get lost in my thoughts sometimes. Yeah. So um, uh, you have the red, white, and blue. And now between uh, the 1930s when um, Coca-Cola adopted Santa Claus as their spokes elf and the 1860s when the Civil War was going on, Santa Claus went through a variety of costume and outfit changes. Sometimes he appears in all brown. Sometimes he ap appears in black and red. Sometimes it's red, white, blue, and green. Um, you know, so if, if this were really an Amanita Muscaria secret, wouldn't it have been uniform from the beginning? Hmm. Like with the outfit? It, it just so happened that Coca-Cola, and I agree with you, um, was advertising using red and white. And so that's the colors they chose chose for Santa Claus. And there was already a cultural bedding there of red and white and blue in Santa's outfit because of the American flag. So it was an easy transition for the American public. Mm -hmm. There's a, your, I think the chapter is um, in your book is, is the true history of the psychedelic Santa Claus. I, I think that that's the name of the, the chapter in, in the sub. Yeah. The sub chapter. Yeah. And um, you, you went pretty deeply into all of this. I'm wondering if you could just comment on a couple different, you know, historical lines there. What is the difference then between St. Nicholas and what we know of today as Santa Claus? So that's a great question. It's interesting because St. Nicholas actually did have what we would call shamanic powers, hmm. at least in, in one episode uh, uh, written about him, whereas Santa Claus never actually did. The idea of the whole flying reindeer thing and reindeer drinking, you know, or eating Amanita muscaria, that's a correlation equaling causation thing because when Santa Claus first came over here, or 
again, excuse me, when St. Nick first came over here and merged with Santa Claus, reindeer weren't even part of the story. Santa would either just walk places or um, in some cases he had a boat. Other times he was on a bicycle. Sometimes it was a car. I mean, are we supposed to believe that he was filling up this car engine with Amanita muscaria mushroom? I mean, it's ridiculous. Right, right. You know? So it's they don't these conspiracy theorists do not realize the larger larger cultural context that were happening at this time. They focus in on the one little narrow piece of hypothesis, let's say, because it's not really evidence. And they just they, they build their entire case around that. And it's like, well, why don't we unpack that and see if there's anything there to start with? And um, if your listeners are kind enough to pick up a copy of my book and get really deep in, they'll see there's absolutely no connection between Santa Claus and the Amanita Muscaria whatsoever. Hmm. None. Hmm. But what about the pictures from old cards with elves, Christmas cards with mushrooms? Those aren't Christmas cards. That one of the one of the big um um fallacies of this entire hypothesis uh, or conspiracy i should say uh perpetrated by even smart guys like jerry brown um joe rogan jonathan ott all uh, i'm sure paul stamets as well like all very smart guys but what they are and they're not historians <laughs> so what they do is they just see a card and they're oh look amanita muscaria and snow this must be a christmas card but if you actually look at the cards they all say gluckig mlecher which is happy new year there's not a single christmas card among them in fact there is no such thing as one of these earlier cards in the Germanic areas. There is no such thing as one that it features Christmas themes and the Amanita Muscaria. Now, when those cards eventually made their way to the United States, people were just attracted to them because Christmas was now becoming centered around children. And so were Amanita Muscarias, and that's why they, they turn up in, in fairy tales and things like that. And there's a whole back history we could get into about that, but, you know, it's... That would take a lot of time, mm -hmm. um, but I'm happy to answer it. So they, um, the cards themselves were never meant to be Christmas cards until they came to America. And I found this great quote from a guy um, named Francis Hamilton who was speaking to Congress and they were talking about tax issues and he talked about these cards and it was like, Oh my goodness. I, I finally like there, there's a direct guy from that time and place. I think this was like 1912, 1913 actually discussing what these were. And he said, you know, we didn't know anything about these cards. We didn't know what they meant, but people just started digging them. They just, they liked the way they looked. And what happened was manufacturers in America started to add symbols of, of luck as, uh, excuse me, um, sorry, Started to add American symbols of luck to these cards. If you look at the earliest of these of these New Year cards, they show things like pigs and Amanita muscaria mushroom, and they were called in German um, the the Glucks pigs and uh, the Pilsenbaum, the, the the lucky pig and the fly agar. Those are symbols of luck in the Germanic lands in Europe. Now, why there are symbols of luck has been lost to history. I hypothesize in the book that, well, if you're on your way to a New Year party and you stumble across Amanita Muscaria, it's going to be a way better party. So maybe that's where it comes from. You know, <laughs> no doubt people were, were definitely experimenting with these things, but that's not where the motif comes from. So um, when they finally came to America, they were only seen as symbols of luck. And f manufacturers in America said, well, these aren't our symbols of luck. So let's add ours. So in later cards, you have the Amanita muscaria mushroom, you have the pigs, and then you have decisively American symbols of luck, like four-leaf clovers and horseshoes. So if you look at the early Germanic cards, the horseshoes and the four-leaf clovers are absent because th those do not pertain to the Germanic lands. So you can actually trace the development of these cards, the history of them, based on what appears on them. And I do that in the book and show that there's nothing here to suggest anything that they had anything to do with Christmas. Now, uh, let me just say, when they do eventually come to America, you'll get cards that say Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year that'll have Amanita muscaria mushrooms. But again, this is just a holdover from the Germanic original. Mm -hmm. There are no known American cards that say Merry Christmas that have an Amanita muscaria, Santa Claus, or both on them. Not mm. one. Hmm. So, so when until somebody shows me one of those, I'm going to say that this is all horseshit. A card with like a, a Santa Claus holding a mushroom saying yes. Merry Christmas, let's all get high. Uh, or, or just a card that says Merry Christmas alone with a mushroom 
Like, I'll take that as well. They don't exist. There have been some recently, if you were to Google Amanita Muscari and Santa Claus, that people have doctored today and, you know, made their own. But they're, you know, from a few years ago, like you said, this mm -hmm. is like it's kind of become a craze now. So. Right, right. So you were saying before, let's get into a little bit about, like, the actual shamanic, uh, I don't want to say Santa Claus, but uh, you were saying that, you know, St. Nicholas, Santa Claus are different. I don't think that you properly... Uh, explained that there before, uh, but that there is some history that St. Nicholas had shamanic powers. You want to just unpack that a little bit? Yeah, sure. There's one story where um, uh, St. Basil was handing out, uh, he was doling out a, a potion from a golden jug at this party for the saints. And while all the saints are yucking it up and drinking and enjoying themselves, St. Nicholas actually falls into a shamanic trance because he was naturally prone to these shamanic trances. So when he was drinking this, this special potion, he, he, he falls asleep and all the other saints wake him up and say, you know, what's going on here? And he says, oh, I'm sorry, I had, there was a ship lost at sea. I had to go save the sailors. Santa Claus, or Saint Nick, excuse me, was actually a, uh, the patron saint of sailors at first. Hmm. Uh, so again, it has nothing to do with shaman, uh, reindeer herding shamans <laughs> at all. He was the patron saint of, of sailors. Mm -hmm. So and that's it. That's the one story. And, and it has him astral projecting from drinking what was probably something entheogenic in nature, at least according to this story. He's flying through the air and there are no reindeers at all. So where is this connection between reindeers said and flying and Santa Claus flying? In the one instance we have of St. Nicholas actually astral projecting, reindeer play no role at all. Mm -hmm. So now what? So who? So then, who? Who is Santa Claus, uh, and how? How is he different than uh, Saint Nicholas? That is, I mean, we could spend the rest of the time talking about that. Like, there is a very rich. I mean, I, I wouldn't even know where to begin with that. It just it it started off as this way to. Um, it's it's too difficult. It, okay. It's a complex historical web. I'm sorry of, okay. of how this actually happened. It's just there's no there's no easy way to tell that story, and I apologize to your to your listeners. There, no, there just isn't. That's great. I appreciate it's, that you acknowledged your limitations rather than making something up. Uh, but we'll 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 draw from that that there is definitely a clear delineation that they are separate people that ended up being merged together in one sort of modern legend that was sort of yes. ultimately congealed into the modern mind through the marketing around Coca-Cola. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, I, I would, I would be, I, I'd be as full of crap as a holy mushroom conspiracy theorist if I were to try to unpack all that right now. Right. I just, I, I love how harsh you are on the, on the holy mushroom conspiracy theorist. I was listening to um, uh, last year, I was listening to a couple of lectures. I think it was Jerry Brown, about uh, the psychedelic gospels, is that is, is this the right person? And the way he was describing some of these things and all the you know, and I don't want to go too deep into this right now because I'll ask you about it later. But uh, about the different representations of the mushrooms and Christianity and stuff, it was like the way he was describing it seemed like there was no difference between psilocybin and amanita muscari at all experientially. And I wondered like, have you had either of these? Cause I feel like if you had, oh, yes. you, you would know that there's a clear, obvious difference unless for some reason you're blinded from that obvious difference. And it, it really led me to be sort of, I mean, I, I was like, well, I'm not going to waste my time listening to something that does not make any logical sense or reasonable sense. <laughs> um, but I, I was definitely curious if you have anything to comment on that. Yeah, sure. Well, Jerry is a very smart fellow. Um, I happen to like him a lot. We're friends. Uh, I clearly disagree, you know, with him, and he disagrees with me in, in this particular area. Um, and he is well versed with the differences in mushrooms. Uh, he's eaten nominated muscaria. He's eaten psilocybin, so he knows the difference. Hmm. The problem is that difference flies in the face of the conspiracy. Hmm. So he's going to ignore it, and it's not not through any malice. It's just he's he he has his you know, his dial set to this and any evidence that shows otherwise he's going to ignore. That's what makes it a conspiracy theory and not actual scholarship. And it's a shame because he could have written a really great book on psychedelic Christianity and he chose to go the holy mushroom route. Mm. Well, the, uh, you know, I have a, I have a complicated relationship with a, with a, a journalist named James Kent uh, and his, his take on, on psychedelic culture and psychedelic history, but he has an excellent, I think it's like a three hour episode where he unpacks what he sees as the, the crypto, the crypto mushroom cult in psychedelic culture and how it's, 
then it, it's its relationship to all this weird stuff and even like um yon Irvin and his Ugh. sort of like propagation of of the of the holy mushroom and the cross later on and the connection between him and this other famous mushroom scholar and another famous mushroom scholar whose name was like basically stricken from the public record after he was convicted of being a pedophile james arthur yeah and that there's these this relationship between like chapters being stolen and books being stolen and it's like Mm -hmm. this weird messed up conspiracy and yet you know a lot of these ideas are taken as just being you know correct in some way or I, I, I don't know why I mean like to me it seems kind of ridiculous to think that early Christianity was based in, the, in, in that Jesus wasn't real he was a mushroom and that the spots in the mushroom and it was a big fertility cult and there was like the spots represent semen and there's all this yeah. urine drinking and all this stuff I mean like I feel like there's enough and as you present in the book there's enough blatant evidence of other entheogenic substances being used that it doesn't make any sense that they would that 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 they're hiding the great yeah, that they'd secret. Hide one. Yeah, they yeah. wrote openly about cannabis, <laughs> but they hid the holy mushroom. <laughs> you know that doesn't make any sense. And I apologize if I come off as a little harsh with this whole holy mushroom conspiracy. I really do. It's just that I am pretty much waterboarded every day by people that believe this crap, and it's it's frustrating because again, people don't even know what they don't know, mm-hmm. and. I mean, I have people that that'll, you know, say, well, have you read the sacred mushroom and the cross? And it's like, yeah, I read it five times and I bet you've never read it once. Have you? Mm-hmm. Well, no, I mean, I, I skimmed it. Yeah. You don't know what you're talking about. And it's like, I, I guess my harshness is a reaction to the harshness I get on a pretty regular basis from, I mean, if you, have you ever had a conversation with a conspiracy theorist? It's the most frustrating, aggravating thing on the planet. Yes. Because they all think, I mean, they, they, they all think they're so intelligent. It's, it's really amazing to me. But anyway, sorry. Actually, the day, the day that I'm releasing this episode, or the, the week that I'm recording this, uh, is the week that I release my conversation with Eric Davis, where we talk about the issues around specifically flat earth theory and the dissolution of objective reality through like the dissolution of you know, uh, reliable news media outlets and, and, and all this other stuff and echo chambers on the internet and blah, blah, blah. But let's, let's just put, let's just couch that for a second, put it aside. There are drugs, like people were getting high in the Bible and it's, it's not a conspiracy. It's just like, I mean, the conspiracy might be the suppression of it. So what drugs were people taking in, in early Christianity? Uh, Actually, wait, let's just, before we go there, maybe we'll stay with Christmas for a second. Sure. What drugs were people taking during Christmas? Were people getting high around oh, yeah. Christmas time? Because I oh, know yeah. that there's some stuff about um, uh, Sa- Saturn and um, ba- Baca something. Yeah. Bacchus? The Saturnalia, Bacchus? the Bacchanalia. Yes. Yeah. Maybe talk sure. a little bit about that and then we'll get into the, the roots of Christian entheogenic use. Absolutely. So Saturnalia was a Roman festival that ran from December 17th to December 23rd. And it was just this really big party. <coughs> now, one commentator from the time, a guy named Lucian of Samosata, um, he gives us, it's one of our best sources for what Saturnalia was like. He talks about uh, what were called in Rome in those days, Pocolamatoria, t- which was a general term for recreational drug. That's what it was called. Mm-hmm. And he talks about the pocolamatoria that were passed around at the dinner tables. So we know that people were absolutely using, and we don't, you know, whatever was in the pocolamatoria could have been cannabis, could have been mandrake, hell, could have been a mushroom. Absolutely. There, there's no, you know, absolutely could have been. We don't know what it was. Um, but to get from there to painting mushrooms in Christian art is, you know, that's a big leap. Um, so what, ha- what you get is now people converting from paganism into Christianity. There's this this popular idea today that it was, you know, the, the Christian oppressors forcing all the pagans to be Christian. No, most people converted because they actually found Christianity attractive. Mm-hmm. But they also found it a little difficult to give up some of their excesses from their pagan days. So they, what you have are people converting to Christianity and bringing these ecstasy cups, as they were called, into their new religion. Uh, then you also have the Yule celebrations from Northern Europe, where people were would, had special kinds of beers that they would drink for the, the solstice and the New Year and all that. Um, things contain, could contain things like henbane, mandrake, probably Amanita muscaria mushroom, 
And up until really the 1800s, the late 1800s, Christmas was not a child-friendly holiday. In the 1700s, there was a guy, I forget his name, there was a pastor, Pastor Samuel something, I forget, but he wrote about, um, he was upset that people were celebrating Christmas, and he actually writes, it's like, you would think they were celebrating the birth of, ba- birth of Bacchus instead of the birth of Jesus, mm-hmm. because, you know, people were partying hard. When, and this is good, because this will get back to something we were talking about earlier with the Amanita muscaria mushroom. As the Amanita muscaria and the idea of fairy realms, which were used to be adult topics, became relegated to the nursery, that's when you start to see Amanita muscaria popping up in children's book and on those postcards along with little children. Hmm. So it's, people were, up until the 1800s, Christmas was not a family-friendly holiday at all. And so people were getting quite debaucherous. And I mean, at, at least in um, in New England, I mean, at any apothecary you could get, I mean, pounds of hash, pounds of opium, pounds of belladonna for pennies. Mm. So people were adding this to their beers mm. and their drinks and the merriments. So, you know, they were definitely celebrating Christmas and definitely using these psychoactive herbs, you know, with those celebrations. So, so early Christmas or what we know of as Christmas now, was a week-long celebration in no, intoxicated no. debauchery. No, the 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 Saturnalia was a week-long. Christmas wasn't. Okay. But yeah, it was intoxicated. In fact, in, in New England, for a short while, Christmas was uh, was made illegal. Yes, like, I it did was hear illegal. that. Yeah, I heard about was that. Was that? I heard about that, actually. Yeah, yeah, because of how debaucherous the affairs were. Hmm. They were like, this is, like, this is so morally corrupt. We, we got to make this holiday illegal. Hmm. And then, uh, uh, oh, so many lines of inquiry there. Uh, it's it's funny too because like for many people, Christmas is still, you know, a time to get a little wasted. You know, the joke yeah. is like you know having one too many eggnogs. But yeah. uh, I mean, in the past, the eggnogs were maybe not just not just alcohol, like you said, henbane, mandrake, other possible things, and that these were all um, le- legally obtainable in oh, places yeah. around that time. Yeah. yeah, and what's interesting is that. This is in in a few years. You're going to have the great invasion of the the Germanic postcards with the Amanita muscaria, mm-hmm. and yet nobody ever made a connection. Interesting. This is a modern thing. Like nobody, like from now until Robert Graves, nobody ever thought of this. Like, come on. So, so there's some themes that are in in this conversation, and they're also in your book. Um, and, and they and the themes are something along the lines of you know Christianity moving in. And, you know, people adopting the religion for whatever reason um, and the religion pushing towards getting more people on board and in the process, you know, either appropriating pagan tradition so people could still have their thing, but they Mm -hmm. make it about, you know, Jesus um, or but then eventually pushing through that after having, you know, appropriated those things especially psychoactive things or or things that would you know be about fertility eventually pushing towards greater levels of abstinence and stigma against psychoactivity and sort of reliquating everything to the inner subjective experience of the spirit of christ or whatever yes so what it is is they were fine with using psychoactives as long as jesus was your co-pilot nobody cared and that's what's so interesting, again, with the whole holy mushroom conspiracy, is that they'll, they'll say, oh, you know, they couldn't talk about it. It was too sacred. Nobody could talk about it. Well, those people obviously don't read Latin because church fathers were all too happy to talk about these experiences, as I detail in the book. And again, I mean, Macarius, who was, who was a, a Russian Orthodox preacher, I mean, he would ru- light up cannabis stalks before he would speak to his con- congregation. Mm-hmm. He had no, he wasn't hiding anything from anybody. Um uh, Basil, Oregon, they all recommend taking Mandrake. They, they called it the sleep of he- heavenly contemplation. So, I mean, we actually know the name of a of one Christian mystery, a psychedelic mystery tradition, the sleep of heavenly contemplation. The idea was, if you felt that the calling of holy orders was becoming, you know, uh, too strenuous or too difficult, uh, you know, you wanted to go out and talk to women, you wanted to go get drunk at the bar, you wanted to gamble. I mean, you literally have the church father saying, no, 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 no don't do that. Just take a bunch of mandrake and have a Jesus experience, <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah. So you didn't yeah. see what I mean. So that that's that's really what was going on. There was the recreational stuff going on in the pubs, 
that was secular and that was not okay. But if you want to smoke some opium and read from the Bible, have at it, buddy. Hmm, very again, interesting. Potter talks about this. Basil talks about it. Oregon talks about it. Hildegard of Bingen talks about it. Thomas of Prasane talks about it. So what's this cover-up shit? Right, right. So what? Everybody's talking about it. What were early Christians tripping on? You've mentioned, uh, I mean, throughout the course of your book, I mean— I, I got increasingly interested, like, hmm, I wonder how I could get some mandrake and uh, how to prepare it and how to give that a go. I know that I could kill me, but it looks like maybe I could talk to Jesus. I don't know. But what were yeah. some of the things that early Christians were tripping on? Like, uh, actually, that might be a, sort of too vague of a question. Maybe instead... It's actually an easy one, though, and is I will Okay, about. yeah, go yeah, for it. Yeah. yeah. So while we don't understand the breadth of what people were doing, because there were all kinds of things going on at the time, some things that are extinct, some not, we have direct textual evidence for cannabis, opium, mandrake, and henbane. Hmm. So we know that they were at least using those four. Were they using mushrooms as well? Yeah, maybe. There's just no evidence for it. Hmm. Okay, great. Well, that is that is a very very simple question. How do you feel about, um, I, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the work of uh, Danny Nemu uh, out yeah. in the UK and his, his hawk around, um, you know, far before Christianity into like the early... Um, uh, desert cults of, of the Israelites around mixing in their anointing oils, things like cassia, myrrh, and, and these other, uh, I think you had mentioned frankincense in, in your book as, a, yes. as, as at one point a very intense psychoactive herb that's yeah. different than the frankincense we know today. Yes, how, do, how do you feel? Yeah, how do you feel about, uh, about, about um, that use of psychoactives, blends of, of strong herbs that would otherwise you know, be non-psychoactive for the person now? Um, I read one paper he sent me. Uh, one of the things is that I am not as well versed in the Old Testament at all um, as I am with the New Testament. So I, a lot of what he's saying, I just kind of have to take, you know, what I mean? it's the same thing with Chris Bennett, who, who's a very good friend of mine, and I think is the most brilliant cannabis historian on the planet. But when he gets into the Old Testament, I, that is not my area. So I, to, for me to comment on it, I wouldn't, I, it would just be ignorant. Great. So let's, thank you for that. And, and let's go, and th twice now you've, you've taken the, the properly academic approach of, uh, of humbling yourself to a question. So I really respect that. Well, I'm going to get shredded on YouTube if I start talking about <laughs> things I don't know. I mean, that's, I don't understand. It's like people, it's like, you know, this is being recorded, right? And you know that there are people <laughs> that actually know about this topic that are going to watch it, right? I'm not going to say something I don't know anything about. <laughs> like, I'm going to get shredded. Great. I appreciate Rightfully that. Rightfully so, let me say. Rightfully so. People got to stop using the internet to pretend they know what they're talking about. <laughs> it was like, <laughs> like snapshot quote. Um, oh, yeah. People should stop I never using said the that internet. Yeah. Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, so, all right. One of the things I found really interesting, um, if we're going to get deeper here into the use of entheogens in early Christianity, uh, one of the things I found interesting is that I think even though I had a sense of it, you know, that I had a sense that there was a more diverse representation of Christianity prior to the so the the the, the state institutionalizing of Christianity through Constantine, that there was a diversity of of uh, of Christian churches, but I didn't understand the full breadth of diversity that was really there, and not just diversity in you know what they kind of believed about Jesus's life, but like fully intensely different avenues i mean on some on some level you've got the the pauline christians and a very sort of like strict way of looking at it it's very similar to what we know of today as christianity and then we've got things like um the what was the word you know, neo platonist uh, yeah. gnostic christianity and then there are sects in that that saw that you know one like one ritual that they did that was included as a part of their Christian tradition was basically a massive psychedelically infused orgies. So yeah. can you talk a little bit about the different uh, early camps? So we'll say the relevant early camps or sects of Christianity and where, where and what psychedelics were present in them. Sure. So we don't know which psychedelics were present. Like, we don't know if they were using a mushroom or cannabis or anything like that. We know at times when they were using it. So in early Christianity, you had mentioned 
uh, Gnostic Christianity. Um, Gnostic, which I'm sure you know and your listeners know, is a very broad term that covers a lot of different groups that most of the time didn't necessarily agree with each other. Uh, as just one example would be the Valentinian Gnostic Church. I mean, they hated each other so much that they split into a Western church and an Eastern church. That's mm. how much they got along. Mm. So this, the first thing we have to do is dispel the idea that it was the evil proto-Orthodox coming down on the hippie Gnostics. Gnostics were not hippies. They were rather exclusive. They could be pretty snotty. Um, pretentious asshole comes to mind when I think of certain ancient Gnostics. Mm -hmm. um, but they were also saying something very important. And I think that there was a there was a very good reason for that pretense. This was a time when people were telling you, whether it was the proto-Orthodox or different pagan groups saying you need to worship the gods in order for your life to be okay. These different Gnostics were saying, no, 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 you need to understand the divinity inside yourself and then you'll be okay. Mm. The problem and the reason most Gnostic sects died out was that they were very exclusive in picking, well, who you know would be saved and who would, wouldn't be. Whereas the what later became Orthodox were saying, we'll take all of you, come on in, you know, we, we want a bigger flock. Right. So, Getting now back to your actual question. Sorry about that. Um, there, there were different ways of using this. So one of, uh, of, of these, of entheogens. So in my book, I, I create a neologism called mystheogenic, which is to use a psychedelic to bring someone into a mystery religion. Now, the infamous Simon Magus, and we don't know if, if he actually existed in history or not, but I, I believe that there was somebody who he's based on. I don't know if his name was Simon or not. But Simon had a, a, um, a, a woman who he traveled around with uh, named Helen, who he believed encompassed all the wisdom of the universe. Uh, she would be the Sophia of other Gnostic groups. What Helen and Simon would do and how they used their psychedelics, getting to your question, was just that, to bring people into their group. They would, they would we don't know how they did it, but they would probably give them something like opium, give them something like mandrake, and then read from their gospel. The, the Simonians actually did have a gospel. Hippolytus actually uh, quotes out of it. So we know that they had a, they had a holy doctrine. It's a shame we don't have it today. But um, So they were using it that way, the, 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 the Simonians. They were using it to bring people mystheogenically. Now you have other Gnostic groups like the Carpocrates in Alexandria, Egypt. They seem to have been using their psychoactives in more for magical purposes, for dream divination, for prophecy, for things like that. We don't have a lot of information about them, um, but that seems to be what they were doing. Then you had a guy, Marcus, who was a former Valentinian. Now, what he was doing, he eventually, he essentially appropriated Christianity into like an orgiastic drug cult. <laughs> That's what he did. And how his group differed from the Simonians was that the Simonians, they would take their psychoactives and they would have group orgies within the group. Yeah. Whereas Marcus's uh, tribe, let's call them, they were instructed to go out, meet people not from the group, lure them back to their homes, give them psychoactives, and then have sex magic with them. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what we want to call that, but it seems a little deceptive to me. Yeah, it um, sounds sort of non-consenting in a way. Yeah. Well, it was. In yeah. fact, uh, we know that Marcus was doing this because two women br tried to bring him to court. Oh, wow. Yeah. Because they felt that he had violated them. Yeah. So, and he probably did. Yeah. He probably did. Well, I mean that that kind of thing even even happens now. I don't know what was how it was substantial. Well, it's obviously happening now in in things like the um, <clears throat> sort of the darker side of ayahuasca culture. Women being sexually molested by shamans while they're while they're tripping, or even not that long ago there was this big uproar. And I don't know what happened from it. So I want to be careful that people don't think that I don't want to be just propagating unsubstantiated evidence. But at some point, a guy from Somewhere in California, Steve Behrman, a representative of a group called Interchange, who, I mean, listening to him talk, excellent psychologist, seeming therapist, that it came out at some point that he had this whole thing where he was utilizing the I'm going to heal you magical relationship, guru type relationship with women, getting them high on 2CB and then basically coercing them into into having sex. So like, even still, it happens now. So I, I, I'm certainly not surprised it would happen back then um oh yeah although it still it hurts just as much to think about that then as it does now 
No, it does. It does. And it's a shame because, again, like we, we have these ideas sometimes that Gnostics, again, like there's this modern idea that Gnostics were these peace loving hippies. And it's like, if you read the Gnostic Gospels, I mean, they were as nasty to the proto Orthodox as the proto Orthodox were to them. And they were just as nasty to other Gnostic groups. I mean, um, uh, Marcion, who was probably the most famous Gnostic philosopher of, of the. Um, second century i mean he was also one of the biggest misogynists of the second century there was nothing enlightened about you know his thoughts on women at all Mm. so you know it's just you know one of those things we have to take history for what it is and you get too much of people really trying to correct for history or trying to rewrite it or add their own thing to it and you know that's again that's just conspiracy theory that's not real history Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's interesting how uh, how much confirmation bias comes into how we look up information, myself included. You know, I oh yeah, all of them. Me too. All subject to it, um, we are. So, all right. But if you're checking against it, if you're at least aware of that, you have a leg up on everybody else who just doesn't even know what they don't even know. Right, right. We at no. least know what we don't know. Yeah, for sure. Or know that we don't know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or know that we don't know. Yeah, and it's but, good to have intellectual community that keeps you in check. It seems like uh, seems like you have a good relationship um, with other people in your field, even people you disagree with, which I think is incredible to have good intellectual discourse, respectful discourse with people who you just like straight up disagree with their conclusions yeah. on things. Well, I mean, with Jerry Brown, for example, like, like let me say this, that Jerry and I agree on almost everything regarding to psychedelic history except for the mushroom and christian art hmm. but everything else i mean we're, we're pretty decordo mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. cool so the current christian mm, see it's 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 funny as we say as i say christianity it comes with this sense of like uh that one thing which is clearly not the case now it wasn't the case then um but to generalize now there is a some common themes one of the common themes is essentially abstinence from sexuality and from drugs how did we get there um sure. I mean, generally you know from from you know mandrake and henbane and orgiastic sex cult i I mean you said that was kind of co-opted but from church fathers saying something along the lines of like as you write in your book that you could use mandrake to go into as you what do you call it a somni theogenic sleep type psychoactive experience to commune with jesus to you know like don't do the weeds you know the the devil's weed and, and and all this stuff like how did we how did we get there well, a lot of that actually comes from so there were there were broadly speaking again two different kinds of Gnostics. There were the the Marcus kind of Gnostics who were like, "Hey, we're all divine, let's party," and there were other Gnostics like the Ebionites who were more Jewish in their in their um, philosophies that thought that all materialism is evil, and so you have to avoid it. So they avoided sex for one, and they certainly weren't taking any kinds of psychoactives. Again, this is another reason why these kinds of Gnostic sects died out. If you're not procreating, you know, whatever generation formed that sect is going to be the last generation of that sect. Yeah. So um, you have uh, that idea stems from this, this form of Gnosticism that sees all material existence as corruptible and evil. And going through the years you have church fathers kind of fighting off that concept. Now, because they were fighting off the concept that flesh is evil and taking these things is all evil, it in an odd way opened the door for them to say, oh, so Mandrake is fine. Wait, wait, Why? wait. Well, so, because so, our enemies are saying it isn't fine. So when you're talking about church fathers, you're talking about sort of the other camp, what do you, the proto-Orthodox camp of Christianity yeah, the guys versus, that versus the Gnostics. The guys yeah, that won. Okay. Call- yeah, I call them proto-Orthodox because everybody in those days believed themselves to be Orthodox. According to Marcus, he was Orthodox. To Valentinian, Valentinus, excuse me, he was Orthodox. Marcion was Orthodox. The Polycians were Orthodox. Everybody thought they were Orthodox and that everybody else wasn't. So, again, there's also, let me, 
um, say that there was never, there has never been a uniformity of opinion in these matters. So as much as I'm talking about guys like Oregon and Thomas of Persane and Hildegard of Bingen saying, yeah, go ahead and take Mandrake, there were guys like Ambrose, who is now St. Ambrose, saying, what? You can't be taking this stuff. Like, this is all sinful. Um, there's this one great um, uh, piece of writing from Ambrose, actually, where he admonishes the other church fathers saying, you guys are taking opium every single day. Like, I don't even need to talk about this stuff. You're all familiar with it. You're pretending to have stomach troubles just so you could take opium. Hmm. Hmm. So, you know, it, it, there's never just been a monolithic idea of it. And even today we have, it, it's this this kind of balancing act that we do, isn't it? Where you, you were saying before, and I agree, sometimes people use Christmas. Yeah, this is my excuse to let loose and party. Mm -hmm. And then you have the other side of it that's, oh, Christmas is about kids and we can't corrupt them by letting them know that alcohol exists or whatever. And it's just like, it's just this weird kind of hypocritical balancing act. Mm -hmm. So let's, let's get back on, uh, thank you. And let's get back on the thread, you know, how we got from psychedelically inclined Christian churches and church groups um to to the uh to where we are now which is i mean generally speaking most christian churches are like don't have sex before it's your wife or husband don't ever take drugs at all except for some alcohol sometimes is okay because jesus drunk, drank wine or whatever um, i know i was handed to you by a priest no less <laughs> <laughs> well so let's let, let's go back because you said that when when the when certain camps of the gnostics were saying like you know like pure abstinence then the main the main sort of canon of, of church fathers was saying like, oh, we disagree with them. So it's OK to have a little bit of this and a little bit of that. Uh, can you just jump back in on that thread? Sure. Again, this is all within the confines of the proto-Orthodox paradigm. So to take Mandrake and, you know, uh, um, be in conversation with the dyad, which was a two form being in Gnosticism, that would be that's wrong. That's heretical. But if you take that mandrake and, you know, it converts you to, to the, the true church of Jesus, well, then that's OK. Um, texts in those times are very fragmented. We're not getting the whole story. And it, it's we're piecing together what little bits we have. So it's kind of difficult to really answer that. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. OK, so then where, where did it even come from that uh, that it, it, that there's a possibility to interact with Jesus or God through uh, through hallucinogenic substances in some way oh, or that, another. Like, that's is, that, is that coming straight? Is that coming straight from Jesus, or is that a, an appropriation? No, that's of the, an appropriation. Of the pagan cultures that that the church was overtaking. Yeah, it's a it's a pagan appropriation. So this is good. You know, this this is a good opportunity to get into how that all happened. Sorry. Um, and I feel like you've been trying to get me to get here, and I'm just finally realizing it. So <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. It's, it's the dance. So this all goes back to the Apostle Paul. Paul, in my opinion, was the most, um, was the greatest arbiter of bringing pagan psychedelia into Christianity through his concept of the Eucharist. The first there was no Christian Eucharist among the earliest followers of Jesus, like the 12 disciples. When we talk about the Last Supper, the Lord's Supper, that didn't happen in history. Mm -hmm. What did happen was a regular Kiddush, which is just a Jewish blessing over food. There's nothing, you know, uh, um, there's no transubstantiation in any of this. So when Paul first developed the idea of a Eucharist, which again came to him straight from a vision, you know, and he says that it was from a vision of Jesus while on the road to Damascus. And when he brought this Eucharist, this idea of the Eucharist, the body and blood of Jesus, to the disciples, like to James, the brother of Jesus, and Peter, who he, he was familiar with, they all said, what the hell are you talking about? We didn't do anything like this. That's not what Jesus' message was. And Paul, being Paul, said, yeah, I don't care. I'm going to go spread this anyway. Mm -hmm. So what he did, as far as the, the crucial points of bringing pagan psychedelia into Christianity, had to do with one saying that the Eucharist now represented actually taking the body of Jesus into you. So with the whole, you know, the, the, the communion wafer is the body and, and the drink is the, is the wine, the blood of the vine. The blood of the vine, as it was called by Paul, is taken directly from the Dionysian cults. Hmm. Dionysus was the blood of the vine. The idea was you tore up 
the grapes, you tar up everything, and the blood of the grapes, as it fermented, that was the blood of Dionysus, became the wine. Now, that wasn't good enough for Paul. He really wanted to drive this home. So the original word for the, uh, for the Eucharist was the Kyrakin Dipman, which was the exact word that Mithraic cultists used for their Eucharist. So he, it was kind of like saying, oh, yeah, you guys have the Kirin dip now. Well, so do we. Why don't you try us out as well and see if you like this? So, again, what this did was it allowed pagans who were drinking psychoactive brews and Dionysian cults and Mithraea cults to bring those into Christianity. It was now OK for them to do this. Why? Well, because Paul did it. Hmm. Hmm. Does that finally answer yeah, yeah, the question? Yeah, that, that, that definitely gets there. And it, it, it really... I mean, there's, there's, this is a big question or a big argument, and I'm, I'm not trying to stand behind this statement I'm about to make very strongly, and I don't necessarily want to go into it because it's, because it's long, and I don't necessarily feel prepared to defend either side. But you know, there is suggestion that the modern world as we know it, uh, at least the Western, you know, Americanized world, is rooted in some way on Christian tradition, and it's funny to see how the parallels to how American culture goes in, Americanized North American culture can go in and basically, as it does, and it's a big issue right now that we're talking about it, right, appropriate other cultures, detach it from its original sort of sacred place, adopt it into itself in this perverted way, only to eventually minimize its significance to the point that it becomes basically trivial. But now it's not in favor of Christianity as it is in favor of Western um, consumerism. Sure. Do you, is, it, do, is that like a fair comparison? Do you think that's there? It's a very interesting comparison. It, it really is. I would say so. Yeah. I mean, the, I mean, consumerism, I, I mean, it is, is, is rampant as, as we both know you're in Canada, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And here it, it's just ridiculous. Um, but yeah, I'd say that, that that's pretty apt. It's just it it yeah, in the way that it, it co-optates ideas, mm -hmm. consumerism. It just it declaws it. It gets rid of, you know, anything that could be offensive to somebody and it pretty much waters it down. Is that what you mean? It like waters down the actual history of something, the actual heritage of something, so that they could you know sell it as a mass product. Essentially, yeah. 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 Christianity is pretty much the same thing. Yeah, interesting. So let's go back a little bit further here. You got you got Paul coming coming out coming out the gate you know like post post passion and like you know he you know claims to have seen you know the spiritual return of jesus this is the story in, 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 in the book of john the gospel of john in the bible where three days after christ was crucified he comes back in spiritual form is that and and you know the wound is touched is that paul that had that that vision because that's the, sort of like the that's like the key thing that i remember that like jesus came back Mind you, I was brought up in a Jehovah's Witness household, oh. so that might be slightly different. But that at some point, Jesus came back in spiritual form, you know, and, and one of the apostles was able to, like, put his hand inside the wound. Um, Thomas. That was Thomas. Yeah, doubting Thomas. The idea, he was doubting Thomas so he could touch the wound, so, yeah. Okay, interesting. So then I just, let's just put that to a side then, because that seems like a totally different trajectory. I just misunderstood where that fit in the story. So we got Paul coming out the gate post-passion, running around, propagating the one true, <laughs> the one true yeah, Jesus. The only right? one. <laughs> right? um, and and I, I really like the way that you, you outlined how what we know of now is the kingdom of heaven up in the sky above us, the ethereal kingdom of heaven, was actually a, a you know, a defensive reaction to the failures of Jesus's prophecy coming true, which was a physical kingdom of heaven coming yes. onto the earth. Um, but let's say Jesus isn't dead yet. Where are these ideas coming from? Because obviously when they talk about the stories of Jesus, he's doing some pretty interesting things. He's doing miracles. Um, he's having visions. Is this stuff that was just sort of like, superseded over him later as it was ado as it was adopting and appropriating different pagan stuff or you know was was Jesus doing things there was he using psychedelics do we know if that was a part of 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 the of of what was going on like what was as far as we know the reality of the as you call the Nazarenes Jesus's cult prior to Jesus' crucifixion and the, the spiritualizing of, of, his, of his teachings with like the kingdom of heaven and what became the Christian church? 
Yeah. So uh, Jesus is largely known as a healer, right, in the ancient world. And today he was known to heal the sick, heal the blind. It would be unlikely that for any healer to not be familiar with both cannabis and mandrake, because those are staples in any healer's, you know, medicine bag, let's say at the time, it, it would be impossible for him not to know. Now, what's also interesting is that um, in those days, the, the, the uh, first few centuries of the common era, the most popular way to expel a demon from someone was to give them mandrake and kind of just like mellow them out like this and kind of get them high off of mandrake. So because that was considered magical and the people writing the Gospels did not want to associate Jesus with the magical arts, I feel that they wrote some of this stuff out or not wrote it. They just didn't bother to talk about it because if they would have said, oh, yeah, this guy was sick and Jesus gave him some cannabis and it helped. Well, that's now just you know, medical mat, where, where it is, you know, the fact that this is the son of God playing to this, really the son of God needs to use cannabis or mandrake. So I think that they got rid of a lot of that because again, under pagan Rome, magic was illegal. And I think a lot of people don't know that. Um, they tend to think that it was only with the advent of Christianity that magic became illegal. The truth is Christians were the first people to actually lax the earlier pagan laws against magic. Because Christians would at least give you the option of converting. In, uh, with Roman law and with Greek law, if you were caught practicing magic, they just executed you. You know, that was it. Christians would give you the option of, of, of converting, and while that is certainly bigoted, it, it's certainly a better option to execution. Sure, yeah. You know, so um, it just it seems unlikely. There's no direct evidence that Jesus used any kind of psychoactive I just feel like considering who he was at the time he was, based on the things people said about him, like the actual guy, it would be it would be like saying, you know, uh, today somebody was a, a pizza delivery driver but didn't use a car or a bicycle. Hmm. Really, you were walking to all those houses with hot pizza in your hand? No, you weren't. You know what I mean? It's just, I don't know if that's a good analogy or not, but it's just, it doesn't make sense that Jesus would not have been well-versed in, in these psychoactives mm -hmm. if he were truly a healer. Hmm. So now, that, if he weren't truly a healer, then everything I said doesn't count. Right, right. So then what, um, knowing what you know now, having done all this, this investigation, um, how would you describe Jesus at that time? insofar as like who he was as a person, what he was representing um, uh, culturally, what that made him so popular uh, at the time. What was it? What was special about Jesus? How would you describe him as, the, uh, as, a, as a figure of history from the context of your research now? Sure. Uh, great question. Um, so what's interesting is that the life of Jesus is not very different from the life of other supposed miracle workers at the time. Uh, Honey the Circle Drawer, Apollonius of uh, Tiana, the Witch of Endor. I mean, it wasn't too different. What made Jesus so different from these people? Wait, wait, pause, pause, pause. That's we just it. Had, pause. We have a huge gap that just came up, and I miss exactly what you said. You said... The thing that made what made Jesus different from these people was that unlike all those other characters, those historical personages, only Jesus's disciples said that he rose from the dead. Hmm. That's it. Without the without the resurrection, there is no Christianity. So Jesus, the person himself, um, was a revolutionary, I think, of some sorts. He was certainly trying to overthrow the pagan governments. And he was just another long line of, 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 of Hebraic radicals that was chopped down, you know, by the mighty sword of Rome. I mean, he was far from the only person claiming messianic status that was executed for it. Hmm. You know, um, it, it's um, it's interesting because we today we talk um, about, um, uh, you know, Jesus was was crucified uh, between two thieves. Right. That That's the word we, we say. Right, thieves. Right. They were not thieves. The the. Um, 
the word for thief in old in, in old Greek, which is what the uh, the Gospels were written in, was kleptus. We get kleptomania from sure. the word kleptus. Yeah. These guys were called lestai, which means bandit. A bandit was a revolutionary. Mm. So don't think of Jesus as crucified between two thieves. Think of three people trying to overthrow the government crucified at the same time. Mm. Wow. That's who he was. Mm. Um Let's see what else as to who he was. He was also, uh, no, there were others that were also thought to be kings of the Jews that, that took on. I was about to say he was also one of the few to be considered a king of the Jews, but that, that's, I'm totally wrong about that. There were others as well. Um, uh, and we, um, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. There was, that answers the question. That, that really does answer the question. He, he, from reading your book, he was also, um, he was also the sort of ideological originator of this idea that like the great destruction is coming because prior to that Hebrew tradition yeah. did not see a great, like uh, what was it? It's like Hebrew tradition was like, it was an arrow of time and you were born into this life and you did God's work on this planet, you know, because that's what you do. And then the next generation comes and then Jesus came along and said something yeah. along the lines of like the apocalypse is coming. We need to, we need to prepare. Sure. Um, but I would say that there were other Hebrews before that. So Jesus was a, a messianic apocalyptic prophet. He wasn't the only messianic apocalyptic prophet. He's just the only, like, he wasn't the only one saying that the kingdom is coming. He's just the only one who said the kingdom is coming and then had his disciples say he was raised from the dead. Hmm. That is the only thing that separates Jesus from all these other guys. If if his disciples had not claimed he rose from the dead, we would have never even heard about him. Hmm. Hmm. Just Excellent. like we don't know the names of hundreds of other messianic apocalyptic prophets whose followers didn't say he rose from the dead. So we don't know those guys' names. I mean, we know that sometimes, you know, Caesar would execute hundreds of these people at a time, you know. So there were definitely other dudes doing this. Hmm. Great. Yeah, that, that is exactly what I was looking for. So thank you. Um, now, in the favor of time, and I'm sad to say this, unless you feel like I feel it, it could fit if you feel like you've got a, a, a quick answer to this. Now that we know your your uh, perspective of, of Jesus. Um, one final question about Jesus I have is if you were to describe the two, well, to say the two views between Jesus as represented by the Pauline movement, the, like Paul's movement of Christianity, and the Jesus that we know of that is represented in, um, in like the Nag Hammadi Library and the Gospel of Thomas, how would you describe the differences between these two, these two figures? Sure. So the, the good question. The Jesus of Paul was a human fully flesh and blood just like in the gospel in the gospels as well jesus is fully human in gnostic gospels you have different takes in some kinds you have jesus is a human but a spirit that was christ came into him and then left during the execution and that's when jesus says why have you forsaken me he's not talking to god he's actually talking to the spirit that left him Mm. to die on the cross. You also have uh, what were called docetists. Uh, docetism is from a Greek word, uh, dakeo, which means an apparition, to, to appear as such or a mirage. And you had certain docetic Gnostics who believed that Jesus was never human. He was just a ghost, like if you were to watch... Um, you know, like a, a Christmas carol and you have, you know, Uncle Scrooge with the ghosts uh, going around and their apparitions, you know, watching parties and things. Think of that, but the kind of ghost that you could actually interact with. Hmm. So that's the biggest difference between the Jesus of the proto-Orthodox and the Jesus of Gnostic, of different Gnostic sects, had to do with that Jesus was actually a flesh and blood human born on this planet to real flesh and blood parents. Hmm. So... Jesus being born on this planet to real flesh and blood parents in the manger visited by three magi, you know, or Zoroastrian, you know, astrologers or whatever. The nativity is a core, um, core story or, 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 or um, component, that's what I'm looking for, of the Christian Christmas today. How did the, how did the birth of Jesus, we're jumping all the way back full circle. How did the birth of Jesus 
become tied to the traditions of of Saturnalia and you know rituals to Bacchus or whatever. How did how did the how did nativity get into what we know of now as Christmas? Wow, that is a long, that is a very, very big question. I mean, it's a great question, and there is very much a, a very solid history there. It's just going to take us a little bit of time to unpack it all. Um, the So first and foremost, Christians didn't even celebrate Christmas at first. They celebrated a pith, uh, epiphany. That was the big Christian holiday. Um, it wasn't until, I think, the the 300s, the late 300s, when Christmas was actually started to be debated about it, if it should even be celebrated or not. And it wasn't originally on December 25th. It was, uh, there was a bunch of different days. In fact, one of the days I think is interesting that they, uh, that one of the possibilities was 420. So we were almost celebrating Christmas on 420. That was one of the dates put forth because nobody knew when Jesus actually had been born. So what happened is you have, and this is, wow, we could actually tie a whole lot of things together right here with that question. Give me a second. All right, you got this. So the feast day of, uh, of Eve and Adam was on December 24th. During medieval times, you had a bunch of medieval plays that took place that showed the transgression of Adam and how Jesus would then you know, uh, belief in Jesus led to salvation from Adam's sin. We're all guilty of this. It was a mystery known as the radix apostatica. The root of all apostasy was Adam. Mm -hmm. So during medieval times, you have these different kinds of medieval plays. You have miracle plays, you have morality plays, and you have mystery plays. One of the most popular mystery plays at the time revolved around what was called a paradisibam, a paradise tree. You know, like when, when holy mushroom conspiracy theorists talk about mushroom trees, mm -hmm. they don't realize they're talking about paradisibams, which is a tree that already has a name <laughs> in the medieval world. That, that's how good these guys are at, at their little conspiracy. Like, they don't even know that these things already have names. It's amazing. So, <laughs> so anyway... This one of the most popular plays at the time took place on December 24th, the feast day of Eve and Adam, and revolved around this idea of Christ as the redeemer of temptation. Part of this play and part of the, the, the lore surrounding this play had to do with hanging communion wafers on the paradisibam, the paradise tree. That showed, so the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you know, that's what caused the fall, right? Well, by putting the Eucharist on the tree, you were, you were correcting for that. Hmm. We today get our modern idea of putting ornaments on Christmas trees from this tradition from medieval France and Germany. That's where that actually comes from. I know you have people say, oh, it's because Siberians were hanging Amanita muscaria mushrooms on the tree. I'm sure you've heard that. Yeah, yeah, to dry yeah, it yeah, out. That's, yeah. Okay, so just a quick little chemistry lesson here. Um, in order to convert the ibotonic acid into muscomol so that you can actually consume the Amanita muscari without getting sick, you have to dry it, like really dry it next to a fire. Hanging it on a tree outside in the colds of Siberia is not going to convert the ibotonic acid into muscomol. So they were doing it by, you know, so those are, that's where the tradition of hanging things on trees actually comes from. Now let's go real quick because this is, a, this is kind of a key here to this entire discussion. The infamous Plain Coralt fresco, which I'm sure you're familiar with, where it supposedly shows Eve and Adam with the tree here. Uh, where's, I get Jerry Brown's book. He's have it right. right on the cover or whatever. No, that's from the Canterbury Psalter, which also are not actually mushrooms. Again, these guys don't know what they're looking at. Um, the one in question is, what the hell is it? You know, I, I will hold that. Picture. I will. I will digitally re-add it. Uh, oh, there we go. Yeah. yeah okay. Right. The very famous one. Yeah. Now, what people don't realize, everybody looks at it and they say, "Oh, that must be an Amanita muscaria mushroom." It isn't. What this is, what they're not seeing, again, because they see all the stuff in a vacuum. This one image is not, is one of a series of images that tell this story of the Radix Apostatica. So you have this of even Adam in the uh, Garden of Eden. The next panel shows the scourging of Jesus. Then they show the crucifixion of Jesus. Then they show the um, uh, um, the Pieta, which is Mary with Jesus. And then they show Jesus risen from the dead. Hmm. So it's an entire story showing this kind of tradition of putting the Eucharist on the Paradisi bomb, which leads to salvation. 
Now, if you don't, if you're only seeing the image in a vacuum, I can understand how you could confuse it for an Amity to Muscari, especially if you're prone to seeing Amity to Muscari as an art, as these conspiracy theorists are. Let me say a few things about that image. The top isn't actually red. If you Google image plain crop fresco mushroom, what you'll find are four or five different styled images they're all you know it's the same thing but they all look different well that tells the you know the, the critical observer well these all can't be close to the original right because they all they all have little differences between them mm -hmm. well that's because they've all been doctored to look more like a mushroom if you actually see the plain crawl fresco like like without any doctored anything the top is actually a bluish purple it's not red at all and it also has leaves on it Hmm. Now, the people, when you Google them, they doctored out the leaves because, again, that presented a problem. Now, Jerry Brown, in his book, was honest. He didn't doctor out the leaves. He left them in, which was a huge, you know, break for my case. I was like, well, mushrooms don't have leaves on them. And they also have branches sticking out of it at the top. So it's clearly a tree. But because of the way this kind of meme has taken over popular consciousness, people see it only as an omnium muscari instead of what it really is. Commu hanging communion wafers on a tree, known as the Paradisi bomb, to achieve salvation through the mystery of the Radix Apostatica. That's what's actually going on. But if you're a conspiracy theorist and don't know anything about medieval history and rely only on Google for your information, you're not going to know this stuff. Mm hmm and now, so where does this start? Where does this start tying in? Because you're going on a nativity connection to Christmas. Just want to make sure we stay on that track. Shit. Yes. Fuck. There's so you know. <laughs> I'm so sorry. So one of the problems, one of the big problems with this whole thing is that there's so much history to correct before mm -hmm. you even get to the point that I often end up getting lost in actually just kind of unpacking the true history because again, all these conspiracy theorists are giving you bogus history. So we were on the nativity scene. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. So Christmas, you're right, now this gets back to it, because this play was so popular, and because the feast day of Eve and Adam was on December 24th, and the whole idea was to show that salvation through Christ comes from, you know, um, giving up the Radix Apostatica, Jesus' birthday, which was once, I think, December 6th, was moved to the 25th, so that it would go right from the feast of Eve and Adam, and the fall of humanity into the birth of Jesus and the rise of salvation. Oh, yeah, great. Sorry it took us so long to get there, but that's where it actually comes from. No, that, that's, that's, that's excellent. And I think, um, I think uh, there's a couple more questions I want to ask you. But I'm going to ask you um, after we say a little goodbye here. Um, and I'll release them as separate YouTube videos, which I do um, opt in and I'll post them on the subreddit for the podcast and stuff and on YouTube. But let's 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 just draw a close here and then we'll finish that conversation in a few minutes. And then the people uh, who are listening will get a chance to check that out on YouTube or, you know, patrons of my show will get to see them first. Um, but let's just finish up. Thomas, you are an incredibly intelligent man and I really appreciate the work that you've done and I really appreciate your book psychedelic mystery T tradition and I appreciate what you've offered us here today um, and around this time of year uh, to get some to get some clarity on on uh, on these things and oh I'm gonna interject with one last final question yeah. and then I want you to tell me you know the who what where why uh, how to get a hold of you your books etc. This is the final tr final question, okay? Coming from your vantage point, and I want you to answer this as playfully as you want to, okay? Sure. And and as you answer it, the listeners will know that that, that you're embracing the playfulness, okay? Okay. Looking at the the true history of Christmas and of Christianity, how would you suggest a good Christian today celebrate their Christmas season? Wow, let's see. <laughs> you can all start by being a little nicer to people that aren't Christians. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, can, we can start there. Um, let's see. What I say is um, roll up a joint, smoke it, celebrate um, your family, celebrate your friends, celebrate your life, um, and don't take anything that anybody says too seriously, including me. And check everything I say. Make sure I'm not being full of shit. Like, you know, check it all out. Um, 
if you have any questions, get in touch with, or I guess that's the next thing. But um, yeah, for this Christmas season, just how about everybody, how about this? For the new year, let's all accept that we don't all know everything. I appreciate you saying that you think that I'm a smart person. I'm pretty fucking stupid when it comes to other things that I don't know about, you know, mm. like as anybody would be. The difference is that I'm not going to pretend to know. That's it. So I guess for this Christmas, roll a joint and stop pretending to know. <laughs> <laughs> Merry know Christmas, everyone. Or not, <laughs> Merry Christmas, everyone. All Merry right. Christmas, everyone. <laughs> Thomas, where can people get a hold of you? Uh, where can they follow your work? And where can they get a copy of your wonderful new book, Psychedelic Mystery Traditions? Sure. So uh, my website, all three of my books are available on my website, uh, psychedelicwitch.com. Uh, you can get in touch with me on uh, Instagram as well at Witchydelic, W-I-T-C-H-Y-D-E-L-I-C. Um, I also have a Facebook page, and it's facebook.com slash The Psychedelic Witch, and I have a bunch of videos on all this stuff as well if you're interested. And um, I'm way less harsh in other areas when people are not bringing up holy mushrooms and Christian <laughs> Okay. I'm so sorry if that came off abrasive. I, I really, to all your listeners, I, I really do apologize. I'm so sorry. It's just, it's just a very annoying conspiracy. It's, it's the one conspiracy theory that non-conspiracy theorists believe. Like Jerry Brown is not a conspiracy theorist at all. Joe Rogan, not a conspiracy theorist. But when it comes to this, they'll, they'll, you know, give up their better judgment. It seems. Hmm. Well, you know, I, I, there there might be room for having having you in the show again because uh, there's there seems to be a lot of uh, a lot of misrepresentation of history that you that you uh, seek to clarify in your work. Uh, let's let's just say to the listeners that everything that you just mentioned as so far as links and stuff will be included in the show notes at jameswgesso.com uh, so that they can get a hold of you and uh, they could also check my YouTube um, afterwards to see if there's some bonus clips that we're about to record available uh, oh i have a youtube page too i just never go to it sorry <laughs> sorry just a, it's psychedelic youtube.com slash psychedelic witch but it's like when i post something on youtube five people watch it when i post it on facebook a thousand people watch it so i, I pretty much go to just facebook all right well i'll, I'll include i'll include that link anyways for people sorry. who are an anti-facebook and understandably so uh What's that? I said I'll include that for people who are, are understandably anti-Facebook. Sure, uh, well, I'm anti-Facebook. I just need it as a tool. <laughs> I understand. Let's 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 get immediately into this next thing, but we'll finish off here by saying, thank you very much, Thomas, for being on the show. Oh, thank you so much for having me. And cut. Okay. That's it, everyone. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Adventures to the Mind. If you liked what Thomas uh, had to say, then please go check out his work at the links that he just mentioned. Of course, all of those links are in the show notes at jameswgesso.com for episode 89. The bonus clip that we alluded to recording or bonus clips will be available on my YouTube channel, Adventures Through the Mind, after about a week or so, whereas patrons will get early access. If you'd like to become a patron, it's an excellent way to support the show, and I would really like you to do that. Uh, you can do so by heading to patreon.com forward slash James Debugesso. Alternative ways of supporting include PayPal or crypto donations, or buying stuff off uh, off my new shop, which include t-shirts, a new lecture I just released that I feel very accomplished with and I'd love for you to check out, um, and you know, art and other, other cool merch things, hang on your wall, hang on your body, share with a friend in some way or another, and all of that is going to be listed in the description to this episode. Alternatively, just go to jameswgesso.com forward slash support for all those details. Details. And if you remember from the beginning, I just started a subreddit uh, as well as a new Instagram feed. So please head over to uh, at mind podcast on Instagram to follow the new feed, please. Thank you very much uh, as I as I try to build it and, and get a lot of people going on this on this new social media project. And uh, also you can head to r slash at mind podcast to get involved with the subreddit where you will be able to uh, comment your thoughts on this particular episode. That's it. Enjoy the outro music from the tin box. The track is called Wellspring Unlimited. I don't talk about it very much, but if you guys want to check that out, you can uh, just Google him. He's on YouTube and he's also on Bandcamp, the tin box, Wellspring Unlimited. That's it. 
This has been James Jesso for Adventures to the Mind. Thank you so much for tuning in, and I will see you on the next episode. Take care.